Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marshall Plumley, uh, Regional Program Manager for the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program, uh, located in Rock Island District. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules. I know as a program, we have a lot of things going on right now, and, and even more over the next couple of months. And I appreciate your uh, willingness to uh, take some time out. Uh, as Jody mentioned, this is a, the first in a, in a series of five webinars that we're we're hosting. Uh, to, to build some understanding about the program and some of the things that we have going on. And of course, the, uh, the, the first topic today is, is the Habitat Needs Assessment 2, uh, which is uh, an effort that's been uh, ongoing for just over, just about three years. Uh, the documents themselves, uh, we wrapped up in December, but now we're kind of moving into a, a, a stage of um, you know, rolling this information out, uh, helping folks understand how it can be used uh, in the in the uh, in, in the work that we do uh, in the program, uh, both in the uh, on the long-term resource monitoring side and the habitat rehabilitation enhancement pro project side. And uh, if we could go to the second slide. And so the speakers for today, uh, the presenters for today, uh, Nate Dieger from the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Kat McCain from St. Louis District Corps of Engineers, and uh, Sarah Schmucker from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are going to give us a bit more understanding of, of the Habitat Needs Assessment too, and some thoughts on you know how that uh, relates to uh, ATREPS, how we, how we might do some uh, use that information for planning and sequencing. Next slide. And Nate, can you go to the next slide? And as always, and, and obviously by the screen that you all were putting check marks on, uh, this program uh, lives and breathes through its partnerships. And uh, the work that we've been able to accomplish uh, as a five-state partnership, as a multi-agency partnership over the last 32 years, only happens because of your hard work and, and your willingness to uh, to participate, not only in activities like this, but I think the the HNA2 effort uh, in general uh, is one where the partnership really uh, uh, was brought to bear uh, to help pull that together. Yes, we had some uh, some specific folks who you're going to hear from today who are who are leading that effort, but a good many people on the phone had some role to play in the development of these products. And uh, that's pretty important because this 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 effort, uh, these documents, and this uh, uh, what we've learned as we've gone through this process is really pretty foundational to the next you know five to ten years of the program. And and uh, and so I, I just want to acknowledge and thank everyone uh, who who uh, works so hard to make this program what it is, and uh, look forward to uh, moving it into the future. At this time, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Nate Dieger uh, from UMass, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, and he's going to start uh, taking us through some of this information. Uh, thanks, Marshall. Is, can you guys hear me? Yep. So here's an outline for our presentation. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then Kat McCain is going to talk for a little bit, and then and Sarah is, so we'll hand off here a little bit. Um, general outline for the presentation today is uh, an overview of the Habitat Needs Assessment 2 generally and where you can find the documents and data. Hopefully it, you've, you've been able to look at the documents a little bit, maybe you read them. Uh, if not, this will help you find them. Uh, summary of the what we're calling the Indicators Report. This is essentially the report that the USGS put out on um, kind of the status of, of the river system in terms of very large scale, uh, its structure and function. Um, and then three, summary of the HNA2 report. This is a report put out by the Army Corps of Engineers summarizing how the management agencies view uh, the Mississippi River in terms of the quantitative measurements that we reported on okay. and uh, uh, the uh, desired conditions of the river. If you move the cursor slightly to the right, there was a little thing. Folks, if you can make sure your phone is muted, um, we are getting a little feedback. And then four, um, these are just some thoughts that we've had and other people have had about 
how you might be able to use some of these uh, outcomes from the Habitat Needs Assessment too in HREP project proposal development and uh, selection, and also some ways that you might be able to use the data during project-specific planning studies. Again, these are just some initial thoughts um, to kind of get the ball rolling in terms of how um, you know you might think about using some of this information. But we we fully expect other people to have probably much better ideas and and really encourage people to get out into the documents themselves and into the data uh, and use your own uh, creativity. So this is a, a schematic that we have in the indicators report, and it kind of it, it's kind of a synopsis of how we went about the whole thing. We inherited um, some, what, what are called the UMRS Ecosystem Restoration Objectives. That's up in that right corner. This was done as part of the NEST program. Um, it was adopted by the UMRR program in 2011 as what they called the UMRS Goals and Objectives. And we have a bunch of those goals and objectives listed in a table in the report. Um, part, of, part of what they were doing at that time and what we built on was the idea of kind of building an ecosystem integrity report card that um, kind of flows from the goals and objectives through things called ecosystem, essential ecosystem characteristics like hydrology and hydraulics, biogeochemistry, all of those kinds of things. But what they didn't do at that time was quantify really any of those things. And so what we did through this project was to try to quantify those essential ecosystem characteristics through a bunch of indicators. To do that, we had to develop some new data sets. We also used a lot of existing data, but we developed some new hydrogeomorphic data sets to try to reflect those essential ecosystem characteristics. Those data sets also incorporated some themes and concepts that we were developing through the resilience work that we're doing right now. Um, and in a nutshell, that data and a lot of other data sets were used to develop uh, quantitative measures of ecosystem structure and function, and then brought back together in the context of the goals and objectives of the management agencies to try to set some restoration targets. I'm not sure that we really established restoration targets so much as kind of identified the proximity of different indicators in different parts of the system to where the, where the management agencies uh, would like to see them. If none of what I just said makes any sense to you at all, I would encourage you to read this report right here, the Indicators of Ecosystem Structure and Function report. Uh, we, I think, do a pretty good job of articulating all those connections and then the interrelatedness of the whole project um, in, in that report. The other report is the Habitat Needs Assessment itself, and the URL, URLs for both of these documents are listed here on the screen. Within the indicators report, we link a whole bunch of what we would call raw input data sets, uh, gauge data, forestry data, land cover land use data, um, total suspended solids data, you name it. Everything that we used in the indicators report is listed in a table. It's table three in that document. And then there's links to those data sets uh, in that table. We also created two new uh, what you might call synthesized data layers. One is for the aquatic areas of the upper Mississippi River. Um, that can be found at this URL here, but you could also just Google aquatic areas data for the upper Mississippi River and you'll get, you'll get to it pretty easily. Uh, we also developed um, data layers for floodplain inundation uh, for the whole river system and that's found at this URL here. And again, you could just Google floodplain inundation data and you would, you would find them right away, find that right away. So under the report itself, we summarized uh, a series of indicators, we quantified them, related to three general resilience categories. Um, and this is just some, some a framework kind of developed out of our resilience work, uh, thinking about managing connectivity, which is often really important in ecosystems, uh, maintaining diversity and redundancy, and then managing uh, slow variables and feedback. Sometimes we call these controlling variables, but the idea here is that they're slow processes that happen, you know, over very long periods of time, and, and sometimes they reach critical thresholds and push systems into very different configurations and, and um, that sort of thing. So for connectivity, 
We're talking about the ability of aquatic organisms to move longitudinally, uh, organisms to move longitudinally along the floodplain, and then organisms to move back and forth between the river and the floodplain. For diversity and redundancy, we're talking about aquatic and floodplain hydrogeomorphic areas and aquatic and floodplain vegetation. And for slow variables and feedbacks, we're talking about changes in water surface elevation, total suspended solids, and then we did some modeling work looking at long-term um, changes in sedimentation rates and our sed sedimentation patterns, rather, and changes in forest succession and, um, and forest cover across the system. I'm just going to give you a quick summary of, of some things that you can find in the report. This is by no means an exhaustive um, review. I just want you to go ahead and read it for yourself, but you'll find information on aquatic areas. Um, this is a new GIS data, data layer or layers. It has multiple levels. Uh, one level is basically just a delineation of major features that we could see from aerial photography. We have level two, which uses additional information like bathymetry and land cover to parse out additional classes or refine some of the classes found in level one. And then in level three, we um, applied 50 different, about 50 or so, different metrics to each of the polygons that you can see in, in like a map like this, for example, that characterize how it might be similar or different from other polygons in the same, in, within the system. So things like depth, connectivity, the existence of structure, those sorts of things that really kind of more characterize habitats and that sort of thing. We worked with a team of managers and ecologists to take all of those um, metrics, those metrics that were applied to the different polygons within the data layer, and identify the characteristics that define major riverine features or habitats. So as a couple of examples, we have a class that has a lot to do, it might not be re exactly redundant with it, but a lot to do with overwintering fish habitat. We have other classes that might have to do with channel structures um, or channel conditions um, and things that you might find in, in channel uh, environment. So there's not a lot of classes here, but there's a tremendous amount of information that you can kind of get from this data from just those classes. For example, we performed a cluster analysis um, trying to look at similarities and differences among the pools, the navigation pools of the Mississippi River system uh, in terms of just the aquatic habitat. So it, I don't know if you can see it very well, but down in the table at the bottom of that figure are all of the different um, aquatic functional classes, we call them. And then there's groupings in terms of how the multivariate cluster analysis came out. And then there's a quantification of how much of those different uh, features are in each cluster. And it resulted in eight different zones or clusters of pools within the Mississippi River system. So these are areas that you might think about being similar, the pools within them being similar to each other and perhaps being managed similarly to each other and then and pools being very different when they're in different clusters. We also developed um, a series of outputs related to floodplain inundation. Um, those are all, in the report itself, we focused on one of the outcomes, which was mean growing season flood duration, which is, is shown here. These are maps that show variation in how long the soil surface is underwater on average during the growing season for the last 40 years. And you might not see a whole lot of variation when you first look at it, but if you kind of zoom into these maps, um, there's a tremendous amount of variability across the floodplain. These are important because they're, the different land surfaces that flood for different durations are, tend to be correlated with different plant species assemblages. In the table here, you can see the floodplain functional classes listed from top to bottom, 0, 10, 20, 30. These are basically just 10-day increments of how long the soil surface is underwater. And the top of the ta table lists the different um, floodplain vegetation communities that we can identify from land cover data. And if it's a blue bar, it shows a positive association. So like, for example, upland forest and conifers and lowland forest, grassland and shrub scrub, they tend to be positively correlated or they tend to be found more frequently on areas that don't flood at all. And then if it's a red bar, it's a negative correlation. So those same plant communities tend to be 
negatively correlated or less frequently found in areas that flood for increasingly longer durations. And you can see the opposite is true for other classes that tend to be more of your sort of um, wetland communities like uh, sedge meadows, uh, willow communities and cottonwood communities, floodplain forests, and so on and so forth. So if you know something about the inundation duration on the landscape, you also know a little something about the kinds of plant communities you could expect to find there. And we think that's pretty important for uh, managing those plant communities and the hydrogeomorphology of the floodplain. When you look at inundation duration, kind of unlike the aquatic areas, we don't see real distinct patterns across the river system. The diversity of floodplain functional classes bounces around from place to place. It tends to be really low in the upper Illinois, but it kind of varies um, uh, in, in no particular uh, longitudinal pattern. But a lot of the other indicators that we looked at, for example, how much of the floodplain is in natural land cover. Uh, this was an index that we used as a measure of longitudinal floodplain connectivity. So it's very clear longitudinal patterns. So you'll have to dig into the data a little bit and the information to kind of see which ones um, show you know, longitudinal patterns and which ones are variable just across the system. And then finally, we did a large cluster analysis using all of the indicators uh, from that we had developed um, to look at potential management zones within the river system. So each of these um, plots is uh, the average, which is in gray, and then all the axes around these little diagrams are a different indicator. And the farther the gray area is towards one of those indicators, the more of it it has. So you can see how the upper impounded pools that are shown in orange differ very significantly from the open river pools, for example, which are shown in yellow and are in the, that diagram there. That's those are sort of the bookends of this river system. And you can see the variability among the different clusters um, as you kind of move from north to south. And those were really important. Kat will talk a little bit more about how they, those were used in the habitat needs assessment. But that's essentially something that emerged from the data in our um, indicators report. We looked at two um, projections for future conditions on the river. We looked at sedimentation using empirical estimates of sedimentation measured in backwaters. Um, and then we used that to model out how the area in different depth categories might change over the next 50 years. Um, and so the present conditions you can see for each pool are in dark blue, and the future conditions are in light blue, uh, showing um, a fairly large decline in the amount of area greater than a half a meter deep and in the area um, greater than a meter deep, particularly in the northern pools where we tend to have the most um, deeper backwater habitat. We also looked at patterns of forest succession. This is a, um, a table that actually wasn't in the indicators report, but I think it illustrates a little bit better. Um, one of the features that we were looking at <clears throat> was turnover among different plant community types, and there's a lot of information in the report on that. But we were also looking at uh, where and how much forest might be lost in the future under different scenarios. All I want to do is point out here that when you get out to lower elevation areas, which are signified by this column that says flood duration class, <clears throat> that's where we tend to see the most forest loss, uh, signaling some problems with regeneration uh, occurring in those areas uh, currently. <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to Kat after this slide. So essentially what we have here are a quantification of a bunch of indicators of ecosystem structure and function. Very few of them are inherently good or bad. They're just descriptive about what the system is like. And so they depend in large part on what kind of structures and what kind of functions the river users and stakeholders value. Um, and so we wanted to know what kind of river does the UMR hope to sustain, restore, create, <clears throat> or enhance and that's what led us down the um, path that Kat's going to talk about. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, for the H&A 2 portion where we went to the river teams, 
we took those indicators that they just described and we had the river teams evaluate them based on existing conditions. So we came up with this, uh, a very simple like report card type metric of just simply doing a red, yellow, green assessment where red stood for existing conditions, had substantial deviations from your desired condition. Um, yellow was existing condition is near your defined, um, but may merit action to maintain or improve. And then the dark green was existing conditions meet your defined desired condition, but continuation of management or monitoring may still be needed um, to maintain that condition. So through the river teams, we had them evaluate based on those river clusters. So this table, um, if you don't read anything else in the HNA2 report proper, this is in the executive summary. Um, this table summarizes on a one sheet of paper the entire system uh, existing condition status based on um, this habit, these indicator assessment. Um, this is ordered on the table itself. Towards the top are the indicators that the partnership viewed were more important, and towards the bottom are more the ones that when we did a paired comparison um, between these indicators, th those are ones that came up to be less important by the, the river teams. Next slide. So of that paired comparison, which again, we just simply went back and forth. You can only choose one. Um, so it was like TSS versus submerged aquatic veg and the river teams had to make that decision of what was more important. Uh, across the board in general, these four indicators rose to the top um, in each of the river clusters. So this included the aquatic functional classes, which again is going back to that just habitat diversity, the floodplain functional class index, which is looking at that flood, flooding inundation period, and then the floodplain vegetation diversity and the aquatic vegetation diversity. Next. So from that, um, we really wanted to ask the partnership of, now that we know the existing conditions, where do we want this river to be in the future? We didn't try to quantify future desired conditions simply because that is a kind of something very hard to tackle. But during the river team discussions, we captured the thoughts that were coming from the river managers and scientists that work on the river. So these statements here are things that we heard that simply qualitatively describe the desired future condition of the river teams, of, of these river clusters as well. Um, and we are going to be kind of crosswalking these with those um, higher, those more important indicators for each of these clusters on the next couple slides. Next. So for the aquatic functional classes, the common theme here, if you just look at the coloring, is that we are looking to improve the depth and diversity of aquatic habitat across the system. Um, all of these came up to be, we need to do something on um, what that is, is either, even if the upper, upper Illinois was green, that doesn't mean we're not going to do anything. That just simply means that we need to maintain what we currently have, while the lower Illinois may be looking at doing more of a restoration enhancement rather than a maintenance type activity. But looking at the table to the right, this really pairs well with um, the desired future condition of across the board, most of them. Most clusters were looking to that restore that function and diversity of aquatic habitat and really looking at improving um, quality of the depth and distribution of those lodic and lentic habitats. Next. The floodplain functional class um, was, again, looking at more of the yellow across the board, which, again, is um, it's close to desired, but we would like to enhance it some more. And this really goes to desired future condition of re uh, restoring the floodplain topographic diversity and diversifying that inundation period um, on the floodplain. Uh, floodplain vegetation, um, this one was looking at almost in every single uh, cluster, we are looking to restore floodplain vegetation diversity um, and with the focus in on planning or restoring hard mass trees where it was, you know, appropriate based on hydrology and elevation. Next. And then the last one is the aquatic vegetation index. And this one, um, even though the Open River and Lower Illinois ranked it low, um, the, the river team also made note that it's a, not a high indicator uh, for, that, for those areas simply because it's not a the component of the system. Um, obviously, if we can restore it in certain locations, we would support it. But overall, we would focus in on projects that may not target aquatic veg in particular for the Open River and the Lower Illinois. Um, but again, most of the time, we're looking at maintaining or enhancing what we currently have and restoring where we would like to um, get more of it. And I think the next slide 
think Sarah goes. Yep. So now Sarah will look um, discuss some of how, how we can use this information um, for the next round of HREP project identification. All right. Thanks, Kat. Um, now that Nate and Kat have discussed what is contained within both the indicators of ecosystem structure and function of, for the Upper Mississippi River System Report and the Linking Science to Management Perspectives Report, I'm going to um, provide a brief discussion regarding how this information may provide support for the development of projects and project fact sheets um, working on HREPs. So again, these are just some initial thoughts. I'm sure there's lots of other great ideas out there throughout the partnerships that I won't mention today, but here's just a brief introduction to how H&A2 can be used for HREP development. So currently, the UMRR program implements projects that are designed to enhance or restore ecosystem structure function and dynamic processes based on local or regional resource concerns. And H&A2 can be used to evaluate broader ecosystem conditions that could be within navigation pools or across navigation pools or even sets of pools to better identify potential future locations of restoration projects where they are most needed to improve the resilience of the system. And this new information can lend itself to thinking about coordinating and implementing projects more effectively than we have in the past. The newly developed data and associated maps may be used by the river teams to effectively define types and locations for restoration. They're identifying potential gaps in desired conditions both throughout the system and within pools. And this information may help inform more effective implementation of traditional UMRR restoration projects by better matching them to specific places on the landscape, in addition to supporting thinking about HREPs differently than we have in the past. And that may include considering projects at different scales, such as at a pool or a cluster scale, to more effectively target a change to a particular indicator, um, considering project features that haven't previously been implemented, in addition to considering different project complexities than we have completed in the past. Next. So once potential projects and sponsors have been identified, the content from HNA2 reports may be integrated into and support project fact sheets. Um, particularly, HNA2 can provide fact sheet support through discussions of sections that are typically included within fact sheets that we've completed in the past, such as existing resources, problem identification, and project goals. Uh, some of the examples of information that the HNA2 could lend include looking at what pool and cluster group uh, project is located in, what is the current status of the top priority and other HNA2 indicators for the pool and cluster on the red to green spectrum, um, what are the primary indicators that are likely to be impacted most by the project, what are the future desired conditions for the indicators influenced by the project, and does that support the project? Um, or does the project support the desired future condition? Are there other indicators that might negatively be impacted by the project? How will the proposed project features influence indicator and future desired conditions? And at what scale are indicators influenced, be it the pool or the cluster scale? Next. So as part of the next generation of HREP selection process, each of the three river teams is going to be asked to develop projects and fact sheets collaboratively within their respective partnerships. And the details of this process are still under development. However, there are several ways that h 2 can support a collaborative project development approach. Um, the table that's shown on this screen is a snippet from Appendix A in the h 2 Linking Science to Management Perspectives Report. And Appendix A summarizes all of the individual agency ratings for each indicator by navigation pool and cluster that were um, collected during our individual workshops with each river team. And as identified throughout the HNA2 process, there are various indicators where all agencies within the partnership may agree. There are also some indicators where differences in viewpoint regarding the current condition of a given indicator are present. And that's a result, for the most part, resulting from differences in individual agency priorities and objectives that they're trying to achieve. Um, the river teams may be able to more readily propose habitat restoration projects that meet the management needs for a broad stakeholder group where unanimous agreement is identified, such as where all of the groups unanimously identify red, yellow, or green ratings, particularly for those top priority indicators, which are outlined in blue on the screen. Um, in using Pool 15 cluster as an example, we can look and see where the similarities and differences lie across agencies for each of the priority indicators identified for the system. So as you can see here, the entire partnership within the FWIC was in agreement for aquatic functional class two, 
which is that amount of deep lentic and shallow shallow lodic area within a navigation pool, um, floodplain vegetation diversity, and floodplain functional class diversity, with each of the agencies ranking these as yellow, meaning that the existing condition is near their defined desired condition. Um, there are slight variations among agency rankings for aquatic functional class one, which is the amount of lentic and lodic area within the navigation pool, and for aquatic vegetation diversity. But for the most part, the agencies reported similar ratings, ranging from yellow to red for um, aquatic functional class one and yellow to orange for aquatic vegetation diversity. And specific to the pool 15 cluster, um, if you remember from table ES1 that Kat showed a minute ago, aquatic vegetation diversity was ranked as the highest indicator of importance for the pool 15 cluster. Um, with a documented future desired condition of maintaining and enhancing aquatic vegetation diversity. So all these indicators of high importance were ranked similarly across the FWIC partnership agencies making partnership agreement for projects targeting any one of these indicators a likely scenario. Um, however, there are instances where significant deviations between agency perspectives on the current conditions of a specific indicator were observed. An example of this is longitudinal aquatic connectivity where an agency managing to better facilitate the movement of native fishes may prefer increased connectivity versus an agency managing to reduce the spread of invasive species who may prefer decreased connectivity. And in these situations, some additional dialogue to discuss reasons for these differences um, may benefit the partnerships and project development. Next. So as part of the next generation HREP selection, or sorry, um, with new collaborative project development approach, a small set of projects will be put forth from each of the river teams for program implementation. And as touched on in the previous slides, HNA2 focused on rating the current conditions of indicators at both the pool and cluster scales, identifying which indicators were of highest importance at the cluster scale, and identifying desired future conditions. And all these elements may be used as criteria contributing to a decision as to which projects are put forward by the river teams. Um, the ranking of indicators during this process was a major step forward for the partnership, and new proposals could benefit by focusing on the indicators that ranked as high importance. Uh, desired future conditions for each indicator were identified by the river teams and can be used to call attention to the need for projects that maintain, um, that be avoiding a change in color versus restoring or improving changing a color from red to yellow or yellow to green for given indicators and given clusters of pools. And the relative importance of projects to the UMR program could be interpreted based on whether they address priority indicators and appear likely to significantly contribute or accomplish a given desired condition. So I've provided some information regarding how HNA2 may be used in HREP project proposal development and selection. I'll pass this back over to Nate, and he can touch on some ways that we can use HNA2 data during project-specific planning studies. Yeah. So like like Sarah was saying, when we thought about this and got input from other people, there seemed to be really two touch points between HREPs and the habitat needs assessment. The one is the one that she the first is the one that she got done describing, which is the connection to fact sheets and project proposals, kind of in, in a general sense. Um, and then the other one was a little bit more particular, like as you begin to start designing the project, which may happen before the fact sheets are actually finished, but it might happen after the fact sheets um, go through. Um, you know, we have a whole bunch of data and resources that we developed as part of this project that you might be able to use. Um, so I'm going to give you three examples. Um, and, and again, these are just some ideas. You know, when you guys get into the data, you might find much better ways to do this, but I just want to do this to get a couple of ideas out there and, and get you guys thinking about how to use this, the information. Um, so I'm going to focus on the four top um, indicators as reported in the HNA2 report. So here's one um, looking at positioning projects focused on aquatic vegetation where, A, um, they stand a chance of working, and Sarah mentioned this before, that some of this is found in the rankings of the indicators themselves and their desired condition. 
Um, but then also thinking about where they might have the greatest impact. And when you think about aquatic vegetation, which you can see here for the years 2000 and 2010, um, there's a bunch of different kinds of aquatic vegetation, but in general, you can see that, you know, the upper pools, pool 13 and above, tend to support aquatic vegetation. When you think about aquatic vegetation, we often think about light availability or total suspended solids. So you can see a bit of a correspondence there between the areas where you find lower total suspended solids and a lot of aquatic vegetation. But we also think about water level fluctuations. So there's also a correspondence between some of these pools that don't experience very uh, much of a water level fluctuation. They create a really stable environment for aquatic vegetation. Um, so you might start to think about, well, if we have projects that we want to do related to aquatic vegetation, maybe it's a drawdown, maybe it's an island building project, whatever, um, you might think about where those plot projects are located along the system in terms of water clarity and water level fluctuations in terms of how they might perform in both the near term and in, in the long term and what kind of an impact they might have. You can do a lot of that stuff with just the information that's in the report itself. You don't even need... I mean, you can pull the raw data out, um, or you can start looking at graphs the way I'm doing here. The other one is one that I, I talked about before, so I won't go into much detail here. But essentially, the idea is that you can use some of these associations that we found between floodplain functional classes, in other words, uh, how long the soil surface is underwater, and how frequently we find different vegetation communities there to identify sites where you might plant uh, certain kinds of species. Um, or, you know, developing uh, projects that are aimed at altering inundation durations, water level management, maybe topographic alteration. And then finally, uh, to reiterate the aquatic areas data. So we have this, this large GIS data set that you can use to kind of identify where different parts of the river system meet different habitat criteria. Um, so you can identify sites that meet um, overwintering criteria maybe from a GIS standpoint and areas that don't, and you can develop projects that might change these things. Right now we are working on e moving all of the HNA2 data over to a land cover viewer that we have. Um, this is a kind of a snapshot from a, a video that we have kind of illustrating how you might go about using the land cover viewer. For example, this is upper pool nine, and what are highlighted here in blue are areas that meet what we are calling the lentic depression area, depression areas, or overwintering habitat. And so we have on the right side here a bunch of different criteria that you could implement. You could see what happens to the areas that light up if you change the criteria for overwintering habitat or any other um, criteria for that matter, and just view the aquatic areas data. You can see it um, in attribute table form. So you can zoom in on one of these areas, which I've done here, and you can start to get all of the criteria that um, essentially define that position on the landscape, how it's different from areas around it. You can think about how you might modify that area to make it um, something that you want if it's not uh, currently in the condition that you desire. Here's an example using uh, the same kind of query tool, but looking at lodic um, habitats uh, in the lower river. And there's an image behind here that is an Army Corps of Engineer database on structures. Here we're zooming in on um, lodic areas with structure and scour. So areas that have, a, they end up having a lot of channel training structures um, within them, and they might have deep holes kind of behind them, and that's characterized in a bunch of these um, different um, metrics that are that are, you can see if you zoom in on one of these things. And then finally, here is the floodplain inundation data. Also on that um, data viewer, you can kind of pan around and look at the landscape of, of inundation durations as you're planning your projects. You can export all of this data. You can um, kind of zoom in to particular areas and then export information at a, at a polygon level. Um, this is all just kind of in draft form now. We're trying to figure out ways to do this without spending a whole lot of time on it, but also make it um, the data more 
available to you guys that maybe aren't uh, experts in ArcGIS. For those of you who are experts in ArcGIS, the data layers are all found at the links I showed you before, and you should be able to use that data um, right away. So with that, um, that's a bit of a whirlwind tour through a summary of the Habitat Needs Assessment 2 and some th ways that you might think about using the information in um, your jobs. So I guess we'll pause for, for any questions. All right, and folks, if you want to type any questions you have um, in the chat, that would be great. I am, I'll go through the questions we have so far. and. Uh, Nate, Sarah, and Kat, if you have any questions that came directly to you um, and you want to um, bring those up, that would be great. So uh, early on when we were on the slide um, that showed like the data, I think it showed for Pool 15, um, Doug Wadgett was asking what the white blank area means. And so, Nate, I don't know if you want to go to the slide that that was on. I think it was 27, maybe. Um, and so, Doug was asking what that white meant. Um, Kat responded to him in, in the text, but if you want to go ahead and do that um, and expand on that and maybe explain why Illinois didn't respond to that one, too, might be helpful. Sarah, do you want to take that one? Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is only for the responses from Pool 15, which would be in the WIC, the Middle River Teams area of jurisdiction. And so the Illinois um, DNR didn't provide answers for this one, but Missouri, Minnesota, and Wisconsin don't border Pool 15, so they did not partake in the rating for this pool. Um, the Upper River team, the FWIG, where those, where Minnesota and Wisconsin do partake, their answers are there, um, but Missouri and some of the other uh, resource agencies' response would be missing from there since they, that isn't their area of jurisdiction. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. All right. Uh, next question we had was about the aquatic functional classes one and two and how they were different. Yeah, I can, I can do my best. This is not my area of expertise, but we have a graph here. So uh, aquatic functional class one is the x-axis on this biplot here. In the center is a zero, and to the right are positive values, and then to the left are negative values. If a pool has a negative value, it indicates that there's simply more lodic area in that pool. It's dominated by channels. And if it's more, if it's a positive value, it means that there's increasingly more lentic area. So it's more of a, a pooled or, um, yeah, a pooled pool. The second axis has to do with a combination of structure and depth. So again, it's centered around zero. The more positive values or the higher you are on that axis, the more structure is in that, in that particular pool or, and or the more deep areas are in that pool. And then the negative values on MDS2, or we also call it aquatic functional class two, has to do with shallow. So if they're negative, they tend to have more shallow area. So you can put those, those two axes together and you end up getting four different kind of zones on the map, areas of that of pool that have a lot of lentic deep area, areas that have a lot of uh, let's say lentic shallow area over, these are both over on the right, lentic deep being upper right, uh, lentic shallow being lower right, and then continuing clockwise, you get more lotic shallow areas in that area, and then more lotic structured areas in the upper left. So you have to think of them a little bit together, but the first aquatic functional class is pretty easy. It's just whether or not it's dominated by channels or, or lentic areas. Thanks, Nate. Um, Matt Mangan is asking about um, saying that it would be helpful to have maps for each reach scale um, or at the pool level uh, for the priority indicators. 
and thinking that it would help the river teams to look at opportunities and overlay other layers such as public lands, um, similar to the Appendix 1 of the indicators report, and is thinking that they would be helpful to have uh, the support team help those river teams develop the appropriate queries. Any thoughts on that from the presenters or? Hey, this is this is Marshall Plumley. Um, I think that's that's uh, a great idea. You know, we've been talking about how the science support team can add value to the uh, the work that the river teams are going to do, and uh, that that that's a good suggestion. Thanks, Andy. Fowler is also asking um, whether it would be possible to share. Um, the HNIGIS coverages in shape files or KMZ files instead of using the USAFE data viewer? They're on science base download. Hey, Nate, this is Karen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't all the GIS layers on uh, science base of the links that you provided earlier? Yeah, so this I just pulled up the, the links to those data sets right here. All right, thanks. Um, Kurt Rasmussen has a question. Has anyone estimated what scale indicator values are meaningful for detecting a change? Uh, for example, which indicators are only meet meaningful on a pool-wide scale versus indicator that's appropriate um, to use at a 100-acre scale? Well, no, probably not. Um, I think when you think about Generally, well, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think the way you should probably think about using this information is certainly not at the project scale. So some of the examples I gave where we talk about, um, you know, using the information at more of a project scale, it's just kind of getting an idea of what the conditions might be like in those particular areas. Um, you know, of course, the bathymetry data is what it is, and when you design a new project, you're probably going to collect new bathymetry data or acquire it or, or find it if it's available. Um, so the indicators increasingly kind of break down below the pool scale, um, but that's not to say that they're not meaningful. They're all calculated from sub-pool level information. So as you're kind of indicating there, um, some of them you know, might be really responsive to actions taken within the pool. Um, all of them, of course, are going to become more responsive to actions taken at the sub-pool scale as the scale of those actions increases, right? The more of the pool you impact, the more of the area of that pool you impacted, and you're going to change the score for that particular pool. Um, but some of them, you know, we, we, um, we don't really know. Um, you know, if it's a very rare aquatic functional class, for example, in a pool, and you add uh, a few acres to it, it might be very meaningful locally, but it probably would have no impact on the indicator score. Um, these aren't really questions I can answer. I mean, I can answer some of the science part of it, um, but I guess it kind of goes back to the river teams a little bit in terms of what they're trying to do. Are they trying to impact local areas? Or are they trying to impact pools? Or are they trying to impact the clusters? The river as a whole is the UMRR as a program trying to impact the river system. So that's, I mean, that's just some rambling about that. Thanks. This is, yeah, this is Kat, kind of going along with what Nate just said. Um, during our H&A 2, while we were going through the river management um, and with our steering committee, that was something that we discussed a lot, was at what scale um, do we want these indicators to be uh, meaningful? Obviously, you can use it at, you know, they can be meaningful, like what Nate was just saying, at the local scale, even though you may not see a response in the indicator, we really went back to the data, and we had to go with the finest resolution of the, the of the data that we had available. What was the highest resolution, and that really came down to um, the pool level had the best resolution across all the indicators. So we said you could use it for you know more local stuff, but keep in mind that it's not going to be like a cause and effect response by looking at these indicators on something smaller than a, a pool scale. Thanks. 
Uh, next question, uh, Ken Lubinsky is uh, saying great stuff, uh, very logical and attentive to long-lasting issues. Um, he has a question whether there have been any thoughts about using this information to evaluate potential unintended consequences of projects. Well, hi, Ken. Uh, that's a great question. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by unintended consequences, but it's but I think I might. Um, so I'll take a stab at that. Especially when you're talking about the aquatic areas or the aquatic habitats or the floodplain areas or the, the floodplain habitats. You know, if you change a given part of the landscape from one class to another, uh, well, it goes from one class to another. It doesn't just change, right? So, um, or sorry, it doesn't just get better. Like it, it actually changes classes. So it might go from habitat for one thing to habitat for another thing. Uh, you might want to keep that in mind when you develop fact sheets. This is kind of the way we thought about it at least was you might list the indicators that you're trying to improve, but you might also list the indicators that are you know, sort of on the opposite side of that equation that are likely to be changed because of um, that particular project. I suppose there's also, you know, spatial considerations for you change a habitat in one location, it might have impacts to the same kind of habitat in a different one. Those are sort of different kind of concerns, but um, certainly, you know, spelling out for people uh, the idea that, you know, when you do a habitat project, you know, you're not just making things you might be making things better, but what you're really doing is you're changing a class uh, within our um, our classification scheme here. And so, you know, you're gaining one class, but you're going to be losing a, another one. All right, thanks. Um, Nate or Sarah or... Um or Kat, do you have any questions that came directly to you? Nope. This is Sarah, no. All right, we do have uh, one more question about um, might improve. Uh, Megan McGuire is asking whether um, the river team's, oh, where, might improvement of the river team's perception of the indicators uh, be used to uh, where did it go? Uh, be used to measure the UMRR, UMRR program success over time. Um, for example, updating that ES1 figure, you know, five years from now. Marshall's thinking about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as time goes on, we can use this. Uh, we can update this. Since this was in large part generated by the folks who are most in tune with the river, uh, I think that would be uh, a valuable exercise with the understanding that presumably in five years we've got five more years of project implementation and monitoring uh, and a lot more science under our belt, so there may be uh, revisions to it, but uh, it certainly could be a uh, something that we update. And then we also have the ecosystem health indicators, and we're working on a new stats and trends report, and that those these two sets of indicators can be used in tandem. Um, I wanted to, this is Karen. I wanted to answer Mike Klingner's question about the PDF. I'm going to be posting so on the UMRR website under key initiatives. I'm going to be posting under the HREP workshops piece. I'm going to be posting all of the the webinars, the slide decks, and the questions and answers there. It will be, it will take two to three, maybe four days before I can get those up. So if you can check back, and if anybody can't find them, please um, let me know, and I can I can see what I can, how I can help. And I'm going to post the link to that um, in the chat as well. Please just have that. All right, there's a question about uh, 
Um, from Dave Herzog, is there a particular parameter or a data gap variable that your group would like to see inform the HNA2? For example, velocity mapping? Oh, we don't have those data. I don't need data gap. <laughs> I mean, Dave, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I mean, velocity mapping would be a nice way to classify habitats on a more continuous basis. Um, our aquatic areas does a pretty good job of um, isolating very large differences in velocity among the different kinds of aquatic habitats. And if you kind of get into the, the details of it, we have developed some surrogate measures um, that are correlated with velocity uh, and use those to differentiate among, uh, like, finer differences among habitats. So we have some velocity information in there. Um, I guess the answer to that is sort of what you want to do with that information if you're trying to, you know, map the kinds of velocity fields that a fish might uh, require, then, yeah, you might want to have that kind of information. But we didn't really, um, you know, we didn't really, uh, we didn't do that kind of stuff. So the next steps of this process may or may not require that kind of information. You might have all that you need with the, the metrics that are in our, our data set. You don't really know until you do those kinds of um, studies. I'll touch real quickly. I saw that... Um, Kurt had a, another follow-up question on there about um, linking, you know, project scale um, impacts to pool scale impacts. And I'll just say, Kurt, you're, yeah, you're on the right track here. I mean, all of these indices are calculated at the pool scale, but they come from sub-pool scale data. So you could even do this in your fact sheet. You could run some kind of analysis and say that, you know, if we did this project, it would impact 100 acres, and those 100 acres would impact the diversity at the pool scale by some percent, you know, you could even use that in your, you know, judgments about what projects are going to be more or less impactful. Um, but that would require quite a bit of computation and calculation. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Um, we are getting to the end of the hour here. So I wanted to um, let you guys know about the other webinars that are coming up. On the 18th, we have uh, a webinar that Marshall Plumley will be presenting, kind of giving us a 101 on the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program as a whole. And then on the 23rd, he's going to focus on the Habitat Rehabilitation and Enhancement Project component of that. Um, on the 30th, we'll have Jeff Hauser talking to us about the Long-Term Resource Monitoring Program. And on May 1st, we'll have uh, John Hendrickson uh, talking with us about H&H &H modeling as it relates to the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program. I want to thank uh, Nate Dieger, uh, Sarah Schmucker, and Kat McCain for presenting today, and then also for uh, Marshall for getting these uh, going and uh, kind of outlining what, what we can all learn about the Upper Miss. Any other comments you have, Marshall, or any of the presenters? I just want to thank everyone for their time again and uh, interest in this topic and, and the continued success of the program. All right, thanks a lot, and I will uh, put it back to the slide where you can indicate uh, what organization you're from, and so if you want to go ahead uh, before you close out and make a check mark on the appropriate state and agency or uh, NGO um, that you're with, that would be helpful.